so I'm here today because God kept me oh I'm a Our scripture this morning is from the book of Ruth. You don't hear any sermons from the book of Ruth, I, I bet you. We're going to read Ruth, the first chapter, the 11th through 13th verses, and then we're going to go to the fourth chapter, the 13th through the 15th verses. They asked me if we should bring Bibles from the church, and I said no, because Roxbury Presbyterian Church brings its own Bibles. So I know y'all got your Bibles. I'm not even going to worry about it. But when you have found the book of Ruth, please stand, which is our tradition to give God the glory. Ruth, the first chapter, 11 through 13 verses, and then we're going to go to the Ruth, the fourth chapter, just to get a step, bit of this step story. This way, but Naomi way. said, Thank I'm you, at the first uh, chapter, 11th verse, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. This is the happy ending of this book. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. God's word for God's people. I don't know how familiar you all are with the book of Ruth, but it ultimately it traces the lineage of Jesus. It is the perfect text for Mother's Day. It is a woman's story. It is the story about the friendship of two women, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Their relationship born of pain and trauma ends in love. And anytime we talk about love, you are speaking true love, you are talking about God because God is love. So when you talk about love, you're talking about God. As the plot unfolds, Ruth, this is the daughter-in-law, loses her husband, but eventually she meets another man, Boaz. She marries him, and they become the great-grandparents of King David. So this is the lineage of Jesus, and this is how it got started according to the Bible. But while the book is named after Ruth, it really should be named after Naomi because it's her story that shapes this narrative and leads to this happy ending. It is through Naomi's trials that God creates something extraordinary. So this morning, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about the revival of Naomi. It is God's revival of Naomi that turns this story around. As a matter of fact, my brothers and sisters, it is God's revival that can turn anything around. The story begins in tragedy. Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, have all been widowed. They are trying to figure out what to do with their lives. Now the story takes place in the land of Moab. This is important because Moab is a pagan country. Naomi went to Moab ten years earlier, fleeing a famine in her home in Judah. This is where her sons met these Moabite women and married them, Ruth and Orpah. But now the three men are dead. We're not sure why they're dead, but they have died mysteriously. All three widows are in dire straits. You see, in this part of the ancient world and ancient times, if you lose your man, you have nothing. You can't work. Women back in ancient Israel and the ancient Middle East couldn't work. They had no assets, and they faced a tough future. Naomi hears, however, that the famine has ended in Judah. She decides her only option is to return back home. She tells her daughter-in-laws, you stay here in Moab. Your family's here. You know people here. Maybe you can make a new life, but my life essentially is over. You see, Naomi is old. She's beginning to think that leaving her home in Israel was not a good idea. 
But more tragically than that, Naomi believes that God has abandoned her. She protests to the two young women in verse 12, even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I had a new husband, which is impossible, uh, I don't have any sons. I have nothing to offer. Would you remain unmarried for them? So she's saying, I can do nothing for you. It's bitter for me because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Now, in modern terms, we would say Naomi is a traumatized woman. Naomi is a woman suffering from trauma. Trauma is one of those clinical terms that you hear a lot about in our community. At its base, it's a wound from an attack, accident, rape, or natural disaster. After 9-1-1, 9-11, people thought people were traumatized, thousands of people all across the country. People who have been injured or survived violence are often called trauma victims. Soldiers coming back from the war are suffering, they say, from post-traumatic stress. More and more these days, however, experts say any situation that leaves you feeling overwhelmed and alone can be trauma. Trauma occurs when your sense of security is shattered, making you feel helpless and vulnerable. Trauma can be physical, it can be emotional, but I would argue that Naomi is suffering from a spiritual trauma. The death of her husbands and her sons have left her in a state of loneliness. Now, spiritual trauma is the most serious as far as I'm concerned and because it can't be treated. You can't see it. You disconnect from the meaning of life. You lose your sense of purpose. You end up being a walking shell of what you used to be. The biggest danger, though, with spiritual trauma is that you become angry with God. For Naomi, it was hard to even think about going on. She thought God had abandoned her. She is filled with despair. She is hopeless. Her soul is tormented. And she thinks she no longer has a relationship with God. Now, the reason her story is interesting to me is because I believe you and I know people who are like that. I believe there are people in this very neighborhood who feel disconnected from God. I believe the biggest challenge to our faith is not unbelief. It's the question of why would a God who's a loving God, a God who cares for people, why would God let folks suffer? Why are so many folks suffering in this neighborhood if God is so good? When there is no comfort, when you are left in deep dread, despair, you're feeling like you're almost dead, that's spiritual trauma. When you are hurting though, the book of uh, tells you that you really are, are in a position to call on the name of Jesus. When you are in deep trauma, that's when you should call on the name of Jesus. That's when you should say, Lord, I'm, I'm hurting down here, where are you? Naomi doesn't do that though, she turns away from God. See, she knows God. She's an Israelite woman, but she's feeling so bad. She says, I'm going to turn away. I don't even want to talk about God because God has abandoned me. But, but, you know, King David in the book of 2 Samuel says, when the waves of death swirled around me, when the torrents of destruction whirled around me, I called to the Lord. All right. If you don't call to the Lord, what happens is you go deeper and deeper into despair. I remember when I was pregnant with Nicholas back 27 years ago and I was lonely, I had no husband, I didn't know what was going on, they were talking about me all over. The preachers in Boston said I, was, I should really be thrown out of everything. It was one of the loneliest times in my life and I remember kind of turning away from God because I thought God was mad with me. But it's when you are in that kind of despair that God will come and get you. When you are feeling that you have nothing is when God can turn the situation around. Now let me tell you what happened to Naomi. Naomi said, you go away from me. Don't even talk to me. I'm bitter. And so the one daughter-in-law, Orpah, said, okay, I hear you. I'm going to head on out. Because that's what most of us would do. But Ruth, see, Ruth said, no, I'm not going to leave you, Naomi. It was, it, was, it was God who touched Ruth, you see. And Ruth said, I'm going to stay here with you. Now, you have friends like that. 
You have times you go through when you don't want to be bothered with nobody, but somebody in your life will say, girl, I'm going to stay here right with you. Or even to men, if your buddy says, I'm not going to leave you no matter what you say. Naomi's arguing she wants to be left alone, but Ruth says, no, 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 Miss Naomi, I'm going to stay with you. Verse 16, chapter 1, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Now that's how you know God was in the mix. You see, because Ruth was a Moabite. She really didn't know God, but she had been watching Miss Naomi and her sons and knew something was going on kind of special. And so God stepped in and used Ruth to save Naomi. You see what I'm saying? God stepped in and used Ruth to revive Naomi. You have no idea who God will use to revive you. God can use anybody to do anything. God chose the Jews to be the people through whom, whom the rest of the world would come to God. So Miss Naomi, when she went to Moab, became a model for this young woman, Ruth. Miss Naomi didn't know it, but Ruth had been watching her for 10 years, watching her sons. And just when Miss Naomi was feeling like she was almost dead, Ruth said, I'm going to stay with you. And I'm going to be with you, and your God is going to be my God. You see, this neighborhood is full of people who are watching each other. And you may not know it, but somebody's watching you. And just when you think your stuff is going down, they may come out to revive you. Because that is how God works. That is how God works. Now, Reverend Liz, what exactly is revival? Well, Naomi was almost dead. This is the interesting thing about revival. The word revival is from the Latin, to receive again a life that has almost expired, to rekindle a flame where the spark has almost gone out. The key word here is almost. A child is in a pond, and she's been in the pond too long, and they drag her out, and the EMTs come and they start pumping, and the bystanders, uh, they think she's dead, but with the proper touch and the correct massaging, the heart can reboot. She wasn't dead, she was almost dead. And what I'm suggesting to you, we live in a neighborhood where folks are almost dead. They're not dead, their spirits are there, but their spirits have been beat down, and their hearts have been broken, and all we need is some revival up in here, and God is gonna revive this neighborhood. We have a deep need in this community for a spiritual revival. We have mothers walking around whose, whose hearts are broken, almost shut down. We have young people who, whose hearts are almost hardened. We have fathers existing, but the, but the light is flickering. We are a community that was once vibrant, but we are in danger of death. The spirit is almost gone, but it's not gone. It's not gone. Just like having this event today, having this service here, having this ministry today, and all of these people wanted to help. Everybody wanted to jump in because we want to revive this community because we know it's not dead. It's not dead. There is so much wonderful stuff going on in this community. We just need to revive ourselves. Now you think I'm pointing you know, fingers out to the community about being dead, but here's the biggest problem. The problem is not just with the community. The problem is that the Christian church is almost dead. That's the problem. The church is almost dead. And I'm not talking about RPC. I'm talking about the church with the big C. The challenge to the church is not atheism. The challenge to the church is not Islam. The challenge to the church is not trauma. The challenge to the church is that we are in a rut of mediocrity. We just do what we do every week, every year, every month. We've been doing it this way, just like we did it last year. We don't have to do anything different. We forget it's not even about us, it's about God. We forget we're not just empowered with our personalities. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. And if the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, you can do anything. The power of the Holy Spirit can change a neighborhood. Jesus went to the cross and when he got up, that changed everything. We need a revival. 
revival in God's church. Now the reason that Roxbury Presbyterian Church is in this park today, as I have said, is the Holy Spirit. God used a young man, Frank Farrell, to challenge the church, and because the Spirit was moving, we picked up the challenge. Now, we might have just said, Mr. Farrell, you're right. We'll see you next year. But that's not what happened this time. This time, we responded because we listened to the Holy Spirit. You know, the problem with the church today and I'm not talking about our church. We've answered the call and we're trying to respond to the Spirit. But the problem is that the church has almost become almost like a cemetery. Think about it. People in the cemetery don't go anywhere. They just lie there and everybody comes to them. You can pretty much predict what everybody's going to do in a cemetery. From the deceased to the visitors. A cemetery is not where you go and expect surprises. Huh. A cemetery is where you go, you know ain't nothing going to happen there. It's done. But huh, when the women went to the tomb huh, looking for a dead body, the angel said, wait a minute, why are you looking for the living among the dead? This is a living God that we serve. This is a God that's full of surprises. This is a God who can change your situation like that. This is a God who revives you, and all you need to do is call on the Lord. So this is a symbol to me of the revival of the Christian church. We are going to go where the problem is because that's what Jesus does, and we're going to claim it in the name of Jesus. That's revival. We're not trying to revive ourselves so we can be bigger. We're not trying to revive ourselves so we can make more money. We're reviving for God. And God is demanding a revival in his church right now. You know, when I was a, a little girl in Little Rock, Arkansas, I don't know any of you who grew up around revivals, but they used to have revivals in my community all the time. And we lived next door to a vacant lot. And so every weekend in the summer, I don't know who these people, the holiness people, Pentecostal people, they were on fire for God. Now, if you live next door to them, you might get a little tired of that. Because they had bullhorns and folks were getting happy on Saturday night. Folks were jumping up and down in the aisles. But the thing that I remember even now was there was a boldness and audacity about setting up a tent in a neighborhood and saying Jesus is in charge. Right. There was this expectation that anything could happen. Even if you didn't know the folks, if you didn't know Jesus, you were kind of like, whoa, what's going on there? With God, anything can happen. Anything can happen. And so when we have a, a moment of silence for this neighborhood, when we put our hearts and, and, and thoughts together, the Holy Spirit rushes in and says, oh, I can change it. I can turn it around. I can revive it. The end of Naomi's story is that she grows and grows spiritually. Her bitterness ends because her friendship with this other woman grows. God works through relationships. God can use us to revive each other. That is what community is all about. Naomi's spirit was rekindled, restored, and renewed because of the love of another woman, her daughter-in-law. God's love can do it. We have to be open to God's love, a bold love a fearless love, a love that will tell a mother who's lost a son, I'm going to be with you throughout. A love that will tell a grandmother who's sick, I'm going to stand with you because God is with me. A love that will tell a child, I'm not throwing you away. You are important to me because you are important to God. God's love will revive us if we keep our hearts and spirits open to God's love. Let us pray. God, we believe, we know that we are in desperate need of revival. We are traumatized. We are rejected. We are weary. Or we're just in a rut. But we need your revival. We, 
we, we know we can do better. We know we can get beyond mediocrity and move into excellence, God. Yes. We need a revival. So Lord, right now, we just pray. We pray for this revival in this community. We pray for a revival in this church. We pray for a revival in our hearts. Because you said we're not all the way dead, God. You said we're almost gone, but we're not gone. Revive us, God. Revive us. And so I'm here today because God kept me.